Moving forward. Since the 1990s, selected and idealized aspects of poverty, which are associated with specific territories, favela, townships, slums, have been turned into a tourist commodity in various mega cities of the global south. Guided tours of diverse modalities abound, providing less or more interaction with residents, using different means of transportation on foot, by van, jeep, coach, bicycle, motorcycle, showcasing the area during the day or at night. Carefully planned and creatively packaged, these incursions into territories of supposed dirt, danger and despair offer a peculiar juxtaposition of amusement and fear, leisure and guilt, emotional expression and exploitation. Promoted on websites and recommended by reputable guidebooks, they have an established monetary value agreed upon by promoters and consumers. This touristic poverty, as I call it, is thus completely incorporated into the logic of the neoliberal model of market-based economic and social organization. In my country, the touristic poverty finds its main empirical and symbolic territory in the so-called favelas. 20% of Rio de Janeiro's population is comprised by favela residents. About 1.3 million people live in some of in some 1,000 communities with very different levels of urbanization and quality of life. In the international imagination, along with carnival and football, favelas have become part of the stereotypical image of Brazil. In the Brazilian imagination, as a vast bibliography demonstrates, favela have been favelas have been turned into a central discursive and material reality upon which major issues, citizenship, inequality, violence, are projected, debated, and dealt with by various social, social actors. In the process, what I call the traveling favela emerges, a space of imagination and a mobile entity. As a global commodity and a trademark, the traveling favela is being used in advertising campaigns for the widest possible variety of products, in spicing up restaurants, stores, and clubs worldwide. As a tourist destination, on the one hand, it's part of the global narratives and practices that recentify poverty as an object of consumption. On the other hand, it's part of the expansion of the so-called reality tours, which promise direct and safe contact under close supervision of professional personnel with marginal territories idealized as the perfect opposite of the world from, the where, from where the tourists come. For a few months, I've been working on an ongoing research project which aims to examine the roles played by mobile technologies on inventing tourist destinations. Today, I give a special attention to a device which has been exported to different parts of the poor south, the cable car. My general purpose is to demonstrate how the teleférico, it's known in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, connects to transnational arrangements which situate poverty, violence, and segregation on a specific orders of worth to use Botansky and Tevenot's expression, within global tourism hierarchies. For two decades, public power ignored and often openly reproached the existence of growing flows of tourists toward these areas that it had always sought to hide. Presently, various social actors and institutions from the public and private sectors are nevertheless reinventing favela tourism under the principles of city market and urban entrepreneurialism. This is the case of the Complexo de Favelas do Alemão, a complex composed by 11 different favelas, far from Copacabana Beach, the Sugarloaf, and other famous Rio de Janeiro attractions, which the cable car was central in putting into the tourist map. At the same time, Complexo do Alemão is the target of arbitrary and violent actions, it receives go governmental investments aiming to transform, to, to transform it into an official attraction of the city as a commodity. Rebranded, Rio de Janeiro promotes itself, itself, favelas included, as a welcoming site for the impressive list of mega events that the city has been and will be hosting.
Within these increased investments in strategic planning towards branding Rio on an international scale, one plays a central role, the so-called pacificação. In theory, the pacification draws on the idea of community policy, but in practice, the process works like this. The BOPI, a special unit of the military police trained to kill, initially occupies the territory and clears the path for the police pacification unities, who will stand guard for an undetermined time. So far, the UPP program is confined to selected favelas, which are not necessarily those with the highest crime rates, but precisely those located in areas considered to be strategically relevant to the MEG events. In the case of the Le Mans complex, the pacification started in November 2011, in one of the largest military operations in the city history. Local television showed, 24-7, Hollywood style, images of elite police units along with segments of the army and the navy battling their way through the Alemão, while scores of bandits with automatic rifles attempted to escape into the woods. Since the occupation pacification, not only tourism operators, but several other business people flocked to the area. Meanwhile, major companies, mainstream media and NGOs all highly encouraged those who live in Alemão to redirect their entrepreneurial skills from informal sector activities to legal micro-business. The flow of people and capital pouring to Alemão is seen thus as a part, a part of a much celebrated social occupation that is logically coming after the military one, and here the cable car is indeed a central element. Investigating the Colombian case, sociologists Alvarez and Bocarejo argue that, and I quote, for politicians and, and planners, cable cars offer new ways of governing urban poverty at the same time that they bring the promise of marketing their third world cities. The same argument seems to hold true in the case of the Teleférico do Alemão. We are experiencing a very important moment for Brazil, said President Dilma Rousseff, at the festive opening ceremony of the Teleférico in July 2011. Rousseff also insisted on some technical facts. The cable car system produces less pollution, it shortens drive travel time between its two extreme stations from 50 minutes by foot up and down an unpaved hillside to 16 minutes. All residents of the Complex do Alemão have the right to two free rides per day. In this sense, the Teleférico carries the promise of fostering physical, social and economic integration. Rousseff and her political supporters are much aware, however, that the Teleférico values exceed its impact on the mobility of the underprivileged. The sky slope technology represents to Rio de Janeiro a whole, as a whole a much valid ticket for riding on the magic wheel of the global tourism cities. According to Supervia Trens Urbanos, the company in charge of the administration of the Teleférico, 14,000 people would transit daily through the suspended wagons. Out of this number, 35.7% refer, refer to tourists on weekdays and 64.3% on weekends. The quantitative, which the Minister of Tourism insists in pointing out, is superior to the one registered by the Sugarloaf wagons. If green jeeps have become iconic to Rocinha tourism, inspiring comparisons between favela tourism and a safari among the poor, what to say of this filmic, almost idyllic landscape of a favela seen from far above the teleferic offer us? It is indeed impressive, the scope of the Rio de Janeiro landscape one sees from the teleferic and from the Belvederes at Complexo do Alemão a view very similar to, the, to other ones that have been traveling the world through postcards, travel guides, and Hollywood movies since the 1930s. However, the Alemão landscape, now re-signified by the new mobility system, is also the spatial representation of the current power regime. As authors such as Yves Lacoste and Paul Virilho have argued, there is an undeniable relation between militarism and tourism, between war strategies and the capture and production of images and landscapes. War and tourism are both activities mediated by optical instruments, such as binocular and cameras.
they equally depend on establishing high and distant points of view through which grandiose field perspectives are revealed. This relationship becomes explicit in the case of the touristic Alemão. On each one of the six stations, one finds impressive buildings for the pacifying police red headquarters, as well as colorful panels created by world-famous Brazilian artist Romero Brito. Combined, they allow for enjoyment and surveillance. The Teleférico celebrates, therefore, the favela as a territory with the potential to be reshaped according to the logic of the neoliberal mod model of market-based economic and social organization. According to this logic, and paraphrasing Botaski, one could say that the worthness of a specific favela as a tourist attraction is now measured based on the efficiency of services it can provide for the tourist, its residents' performance as hosts and micro-business micro people, as well as, as its capacity to ensure what is expected from a generic favela, i.e. poverty, some level of disorder and joy. This doesn't mean that the installation of the cable car technology and the tourist investments around it go without tensions at Alemão and other favelas. The most dramatic case might be that of Morro da Providência, which counts roughly with 5,000 inhabitants and was pacified in March 2010. Considered Rio de Janeiro's oldest favela, it's situated on a steep hill not far from the old port. Within the context of the preparation for the Olympic Games and high real estate speculation, the port area is being completely re revitalized. This cost-intensive urban development project includes a cable car system that will connect the Docklands, the center, the center train station, the Cidade do Samba, where the floats for the carnival processions are built and which is also one of Rio's most uh, famous uh, tourist attractions, and the favela Morro da Providência. A quick walk through Morro da Providência reveals the appalling state of uncertainty residents are living in. At the very top of the hill, some 70% of homes are marked for eviction. Critics accurately argue that the cable car is actually designed in such a way that it, it purposely sacrifices many houses to the bulldozer. Residents attempted to block the construction works, but were prevented from doing so by the UPP units. Although the city claims that investments will benefit residents, the only public meetings held were to warn residents of their fate. The mayor's office is indeed investing on the divide and conquer approach. Resid residents are confronted individually to sign up for relocation and no, and no community-wide negotiations are permitted. Moreover, authorities declare the relocations to be in the interest of residents because they live in risky areas where landslides might occur and because of the de-densification is required to improve quality of life. An important report by local engineers showed, nevertheless, that the risk factors announced by the city were inade inadequately studied and inaccurate. Residents also argued that the priority for the community should be basic sanitation, and in terms of mobility, a funicular tram would not only be much cheaper but would also create more integration and not drain local business as, cable, as a cable car would. Residents complain that the millions worth building project, project does not at all meet their most urgent needs. Education, jobs, health care. In this sense, they are indeed putting to doubt the official bet loudly, that, which loudly advertised that the future of the favela would fit comfortably in a cable car. Moving forward.